So um, first of all, the first thing I'm going to talk about is you've made mention of a few really important issues, mm. personal development, leadership, education, um, that establishing that disparity between schooling and education, which is really important in Africa's development. But um, I think I would like to start from the bottom up, talking about identity politics. So the work that we do at Salt House is we understand that in Africa, we've got over 3,000 ethnic groups and um, over 2,100 languages. Um, and so if you're talking about identity politics, like Africa, Africa is the only most diverse continent in the yeah. world. And that's, and and yeah, it's a reflection of, of why the identity politics is. But I think the best way to address identity politics, it's, it's, I, I've always believed that discrimination in itself is an economic problem and not a social problem. I agree. Um, because it's usually in a space of scarcity. Like personally, I'm from Nigeria, although I, I reside in the UK, but I'm Nigeria. I've got a green passport. Uh, mm -hmm. Back in my home country, we recently had a presidential election and to lo and behold, you know, we, it, it, was, it was appalling to see that, you know, even educated people um, could, you know, take sides with ethnicity rather than values and, to, you know, take sides with religious, uh, build religious or ethnic affiliations rather than understanding, you know, and, you know, those ideologies, keen to those ideologies that would create equal opportunities for everyone moving forward, you know, and it, it, it happens. But why, why is that the case? It's simply because of scarcity and it's an economic problem. And um, if you're going to have to address issues around, I love, you know, talking about identity politics, you, you cannot, you know, make a few paragraphs write a few paragraphs without no, highlighting <laughs> no, well, without, without highlighting um Rwanda's story. So we know what happened post genocide in 1994. Yeah. And you know the first thing that Paul Kagame did was to detribalize you know the nation and you know push for nationalism. And so you're no longer um Uti or Tuti. Um you are you are now um Nigerian and that is all that matters. Mm. You know. Sorry, that's I'm still at the office, so my yeah, colleague. Yeah. And and that's all the matters. And I think um one way that you know that has worked is because in Rwanda is because at the same time, simultaneously, the government has played a huge role in advancing human capital development, investing in science and technology in STEM, um, you know, um breaking the educational curriculum so or the educational curricula. Um, so it, it, the way it is in Rwanda, I'm sure as you've you noticed, you don't necessarily have to go through the formal mode of education to yeah. have have a good job or be an um, an entrepreneur. That's not the case anymore. Um, so um, just to just to bring all I've said into context, um, I believe that the poli if we're able to address you know these identity politics and all of these disparities or discriminations that happen based on tribal affiliations, uh, religious affiliation or ethnic affiliations, whatever the case may be. Um, that way we would be able to solve other problems. And for us to solve that problem, we need to speed up our, find a way to advance our economic growth. The advantage that we've got in Africa is that we we have other, others to learn from. And when I say we have others to learn from, we have the developed world to learn from. So they had no one to learn from, you know, the Western world, you know, the, what well, we call the first well, world. I I I disagree. Oh, just go. go yeah, go. yeah. Finish, um, finish. Because if you look at the the science and technology that we are enjoying today, it's all as a result of the the world wars that have, have occurred, and we know the psychological impacts of you know world war desperation, and then you know lots of investments go into things like science and technology. Most of the things that we benefit, telecommunications, the automobile industry, name it. It's all most of those innovations came out during during the during the, these wars so um we, we we have a lot to learn from them in in sense that they've gone before so if it's good if it took america to get to where it is about over 250 years to get where it is now with an established template and maybe probably tweaking that template to suit our local context we should be able to accomplish that in a hundred years um, i I'm, I'm not one of one I'm not an African who believes in sudden change because I believe if it's sudden, then trust me, some people have been omitted. Some voices have not been heard. Um, mm. you, 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 can't, you can't just jumpstart development. It's, it's a gradual process. And the only way it's sustainable is if it's inclusive. And the only way it's inclusive is, is if we put you know, enough <laughs> systems in place to ensure that everyone is speaking and everyone is heard. You know? um, so that, that being said, I think um, 
the only way, one, not the only way, one one major, you know, and which which is what makes our work important. That's why we we wake up every day at Salt House, because we believe that inclusion is pivotal to Africa's sustainable development. And until we start having those conversations about the different ways in which people are being marginalised and what systems we need to put in place to ensure that they are aired and their you know their needs are addressed, you know, if not provided for, but addressed, acknowledged. We may not be able to um, have, you know, the development that we desire wow. on the continent. Okay, okay. You guys have taken this discussion from two different angles. Okay, but mm -hmm. I like that. 